we too are a praying, worshiping, seeking community, just like Jesus' friends and followers on the very first Pentecost, what if the Holy Spirit came to us right now in tongues of fire, a roaring, came through our screens, through our windows? I think we would be hiding under our chairs. We love fire. We're mesmerized by it. We especially love campfires and fireplaces when the fire is under control, or at least it seems to be under our control. When Philip and I lived in Mexico, we tried our hardest to do a controlled burn of the land to protect it from wildfires. It rains all summer, but it's dry the other eight months. This is a perfect place for wildfires. To protect the trees, Philip mowed the perimeter of the land. A controlled burn along the road would provide more protection. We had buckets of water full, the hose nearby. We were ready to contain the fire we were starting. But that grass was short, dry and flammable, but too short to do anything more than smolder. We didn't need buckets of water. We needed gas. We made a tiny difference. That black part, that's what we managed to burn. But then a wildfire swept through our neighborhood and we were glad we had done our small part. We walked around, we filmed it obviously. We helped our neighbors protect their home and their livestock. And we saw the fire department come. And at least in this part of Mexico, in the country, their tool was something that looked like a wet mop that they used to beat at the flames, which was one of the exact things we had done to help our neighbors. In the winter, before the days of central heating, Earth's early humans learned the power of flint to spark and the power of friction to flame the power of kindling to catch, and God's children gathered around a blazing fire, celebrating warmth amidst winter's icy breath. In that circle around that blazing fire, our ancestors found the gift of warmth. In storytelling and meal taking and life sharing, the ancients found warmth that keeps the beasts at bay, beasts of sharp tooth and beasts of loneliness. Now, most of us have furnaces to keep us from tree cutting, log hauling, and fire building. As our need for muscles decreases, our need for each other seems to decrease too. Early humans' fire wasn't bright enough to work by. When night came, there was just enough light to weave a spark of melody into a song. Just enough light to design a dance from a beat. Just enough light to add inches to the fish in the story. By day, the fire meant food. By night, the fire meant safety, warmth, togetherness, spiritual and creative transcendence. When was the last time your furnace or light bulb or locked door was the pulsing heart of social and spiritual nourishment? We can forget with electricity and power tools and fossil fuels and cars and the internet that we need one another to get warm, be safe, transcend. But we do remember, and it brings us here, as a fiery family of faith. We know we need the warmth of storytelling and meal taking and life sharing just as much as Earth's earliest humans. At the first Pentecost, flaming tongues rained upon those gathered as kin and community in the way of Jesus. They were gathered in the upper room, tradition declares. The same room? where Jesus knelt and washed them in service, shared the bread and cup, pouring himself out for those he loved. Now they gather without him, they believe, but thank God the divine routinely exceeds our expectations. 
the Holy Spirit came down in flaming tongues, setting their own tongues afire with words they had never uttered before. The Tower of Babel overturned and redeemed. Now all could speak and understand. Those listening thought they must be drunk, but no, it's only nine in the morning. We know who gets drunk by nine in the morning, and they talk crazy too. On our downtown street corners, dewy park benches, who gets to decide between inspired and insane, between genius and crazy, between divine and drunk? The burning bush, fully inflamed yet not consumed, now raging among them. Fire is essential to our lives, and it has been part of life from the beginning. The great flaring forth, as contemporary physicists and evolutionary spiritualists call the Big Bang, was the fiery birth of our universe. As this first fire blazed, it consumed itself and transformed itself as hydrogen, helium, lithium, and other elements were created. The cycle of life from death, creation from destruction began. Fire is life and death and new life all at once in forest fires and cook stoves and combustion engines. On Pentecost, Jesus' friends and followers were greeted with fire as they dwelled in the land between death and life. Jesus had died, resurrected, returned, and ascended. Now the moment for them to decide if Christ would be alive within them or if this new way would die with him. When we walk in the doors of Crest Manor or when we enter this Zoom room, we are wrestling with the same questions, even if we try to avoid them. It is a lot of work to keep the spirit alive in our hearts, aloud on our tongues. It's a lot of work to build up the body of Christ. It is a lot of work to be the hands and feet of Jesus in the world. It is a lot of work to center our hectic, heavy, hurting, healing lives in God. Fire teaches us some things must be turned to ash for new things to rise up. Fire teaches us that some ideas and traditions are best used as fuel for creating what comes next. The fire teaches us that green buds will find a way through thick, dry ash after every forest fire. The fire of Pentecost frightens us out of worrying and wondering, what do we do now that Jesus has gone away? The fire of Pentecost puts words in our mouths before we've considered if they are divine or drunk. The fire of Pentecost reminds us that what is most powerful and passionate within us is the same mysterious spark of creativity that can spin our lives out of control. We are infinitely complex creatures and what is our upbuilding can next be our undoing. Our convictions that give us purpose and focus can become elitism that gets in the way of listening to and learning from others. Our single-mindedness that helps us get things done can rage into obsession that keeps us from building relationships or trusting others. We need fire. We need the spark, the heat, the power. We need passion conviction and focus, and we can have too much of any good thing. The ones who speak in tongues at 9 a.m. due to chemical or mental illness remind us that the line between passion and obsession is thin, and it can shift. The people I know who live with bipolar disorder or schizophrenia have a terrible choice, go without medication and find family and work life often unmanageable, or take medication that helps life be manageable, but sucks most of the life out of living. God created fire that gives life, but also destroys life. That is not an accident. It didn't happen because of the fall. It was no later decided upon curse. God created fire that way. God created passion and creativity and conviction that feed us, but can destroy us. God created desire, which gets us out of bed in the morning, but can lead us down dangerous roads. 
What do you need to learn from Pentecost this year? From this sacred, scary fire that unleashes flaming tongues and incites holy speech and frightens people with its power. What do you need to toss into the flames to be rid of? May we learn from fire to cherish life and treat it with respect, to seek balance. May we find gentle, firm boundaries to keep the fierceness of fire in check, flames that threaten our health, safety, families, communities, danger that looks like a dog toy and shines fiery light on economic injustice and so many ways we rank the worth of the humans and other creatures on this planet. We're living wildfires, health crisis, climate change, economic collapse. What controlled burns can we choose now as protection? What can we let go of that will minimize the harm to come? What tools can we cultivate to help our neighbors 